Hello, everybody. Andrew Blake from the digitalaudiomanual.com. Today, let's talk about setting up a remote control in Cubase. So I've made a few previous videos on setting up remote controls, but new information has now come to light. And that coupled with a few viewers reaching out and describing some of their obstacles and difficulties, it seemed time to make an updated look at this topic. Main thing I want to show you how to overcome today is when you can get certain controls working and maybe other ones don't, or you basically can't get anything working and you're not really sure why that is. Having a remote control device with Cubase is a fantastic option. It allows you to do so many things. If you have some kind of hardware device that has knobs or sliders and you want those to control the software parameters in your program, that's what the remote control option is all about. Some devices that you get, you plug them in, Cubase recognizes them, and you're off and running. But I know from my experience and things I've heard from many others, there are many devices that Cubase does not recognize, and there you are trying to figure out how to get it all working together. There's a few areas that you want to become familiar with when you're looking at Cubase in terms of using your remote control and setting it up. The first thing I want to point you to and make you aware of, go up to your studio menu and come down to the option that says studio setup, which opens up a dialog. And on the left, you're going to see various things under devices. As you move down the categories to the one that says MIDI, if you've already got some kind of remote control set up, you're probably going to see it here listed. But the thing I want you to look at right above that or in this area someplace, you should see a category that says MIDI port setup. And if you click on that, over on the right, you get a window that says MIDI port setup. You look through these different categories, devices, column that says I.O., which stands for the in and out, and various other bits of information here. Column that says I.O., or rather in and out, this is what you want to look at. And anything that's in this column that's listed under the in then next to it, it shows the port system name. If you've plugged in your device and it's successfully recognized by your computer and Cubase, you should see it listed here. Now, mine only has a couple of ins and it has a couple of different unique names to it. Your device could have all kinds of different things here. But what I want to emphasize, it's valuable to you to either take a screenshot of this or write this information down. Because as we go through building our remote interface, this is the information that you're going to need to know. Specifically, what is listed as an in and what port system names are listed next to those ins. Again, for the sake of my example today, I only really have two. Another way you can check this, if you're confused because there's so much information here, is look at it the way it is now, then take a minute and turn off your device or unplug the USB cable or whatever connects it to your computer, come back and refresh the screen and look at it again. Whatever that device was will now be missing from this list. Then you can reactivate it again and check the differences. But you wanna have a firm grip on exactly what's available on the in category of your remote device. There's also stuff listed here as an out. For our discussion, that's not gonna to be too important. We're only concerned with things that are gonna control parameters within Cubase, our effects, our track settings, or anything of that nature, automation. And these in settings are the critical things that you need to know. All right, canceling out of this. Next area we're gonna investigate is down in the lower zone. You can turn the lower zone on from these tabs in the upper right. And when you turn your lower zone on, you're going to have tabs down here, mix console, editor, and various things. And one of these tabs is going to say MIDI remote. Again, if you have something set up, you're going to see it listed right here. I have a couple of interfaces already created, and that's why we're seeing them. But to help you guys the best I can, I'm going to remove these devices. We're going to start from a blank screen so you can see what you want to look for when you're starting right from the beginning. As we build our different panels of control surfaces, or some appear that we don't know where they came from, or we want to activate or deactivate, we have control over all of this stuff. In the upper right corner, there's a down arrow. When you hit that, you have a list of options, but in the middle, you typically have the option that says disable the controller script. And if you want to go extreme, there's a trash can, allows you to delete the script. I'm able to confidently remove these without any aggravation to myself because I have all this information backed up securely. And before we finish this video, I'm going to show you how to do that. But if you have your information backed up, you can add control panels, remove them, and know that you can always put things right back exactly the way you want them. The other thing I want to cover real quick is this whole idea of the terminology of a script. When you hear the word script, it's very easy to go, oh, that's just programming language. How am I supposed to deal with that? I know I felt that way when I first heard it. Think of the word script when it comes to these control panels. It's basically your preset. When you build a control panel and you have a script, the script is the preset. It contains all these knob settings that you've made, any kind of mappings where the buttons change certain parameters in Cubase for you. It's nothing more than a preset. And every time you create a control surface, you're going to create a script, or in other words, a preset. And you're going to want to save these presets, back them up, 
and they contain all the information that you need at any time to restore your panel. In case you get a new computer, something goes wrong, your script is your preset. Also, when we're looking at this lower zone, up here in the far left, there's a button that says go to the overview. It used to have a picture of a home on it. It always brings you back to this area where you can see all of your control surfaces. For example, if I click on this control surface, it populates the whole screen, but I can hit this button and go back to the overview. Learning how to navigate this stuff will save you a lot of grief. Now, with all that being said, I'm going to remove these so we can start over. So I'm going to go to the arrow on this one. I'm going to tell it to not only disable the script, but I'm going to go over here and actually hit the trash can and delete it. Now, again, I don't recommend you doing any of that yet until you learn how to save and back this stuff up. But for me, I'm going to clear the deck here. So I hit delete. I'm going to go to the arrow on this surface. I'm going to go to the area that says disable. I'm going to go right to the trash can and hit delete. Are you sure? Yes. Now here we are with just an empty zone on the MIDI remote tab. And if you have nothing installed, this is what you're going to see. All right. To build a surface, any kind of panel or surface, you start in this blank area and hit the plus in the middle. And you're immediately given these fields that you have to fill out. I recommend filling them out in order. So starting at the very top, it says vendor. In my case, it's nectar. Same thing on this enter the model name. If you click on that, create a very unique name. You'll typically find that if you use the same names in any way, you're going to be very confused later on when you're looking at things. So try to keep everything very unique. Even if you're creating the same panel again, I'll just call this LX test. And then the same thing on the script creator, which is you. Probably you're going to want to put your name in here. But again, keep it unique. If I have three scripts and they're all called Andrew, I'm not going to know which one is what. So always give it some kind of different name or different number or something to help you identify this stuff. And now for the important part. And really, everything is centered around this choice. We're in the area that says MIDI ports, and the first option says input port. When I click on that, if you remember when I directed you to the studio menu and your original set of inputs, you are now going to see the identical thing right here. This is why I asked you to get acquainted with those so you have some idea of what you're looking at. Now, I've gone through this enough to know that these first two choices are my only choices. This third choice is for my sound card and it has nothing to do with my remote control surface. When you're looking at your information, again, you may not really know what all your options are yet. As I go through this now, I'm going to show you how to experiment and find out what's going to work and what isn't. But it is helpful for you to know what your inputs are. So I'm going to begin with my very first one at the top. There's no rhyme or reason for it at this point. I'm just going to choose this one. In this case, it says Impact LX88. And it auto fills something on the output port, which is another option that I had. Just for demonstration purposes, I want to show you how the output really doesn't affect the result here. So I'm going to choose no output port. And you could do the same thing. The important one is what you choose for this input port. After that, we go to the option that says create the MIDI controller surface. I hit that. And here we are at the beginning of actually creating some kind of surface. Over on the left, you have a wide range of various things you can use for buttons and sliders and knobs. What I want to show you here is the essential thing that you need to understand, become acquainted with what equipment you actually have. Now, as I've been fooling around, it already did a jump because that's how sensitive this thing is. Every time something is recognized, it's going to automatically, no matter whether I have a knob or a slider, it's going to continue to auto-populate and show me that it's making a connection with my device. On my particular remote, I have buttons, I have a set of sliders, I have some knobs that I can turn, I have some pads that I can hit, and I have keys on a keyboard. So I have all of those options that are going to trigger this remote control. What I need to do is decide which ones I want to use and see if I have a connection. I'm going to begin by going to the pads. They're like drum pads. There's eight of those. And I'm going to hit one of those. What happened immediately after I hit one, the knob highlight here progressed onward. This shows me that I have a connection between my device and my pads. Just for the sake of it, I'm going to hit the rest of these pads. Every time I hit one, without doing anything else, the screen progresses on. If you click somewhere else in the screen, the process begins all over again. I can hit other pads and this will just continue on. Once you've assigned something, you can't reassign it. So if I hit a pad and then I hit that same pad again, it's just going to turn itself off. The other thing that happens is when these things are moving, they're red. Once they've been assigned, they become blue or aqua color, whatever you want to call it. And you can remove those if you want. There's a little trash can up in the upper right. And if I click on that, it either turns red or goes away. And I can move through each one of these and delete them and start over again with my experiments, even back to the very first one. Now if I hit those pads again and it progresses, now I'm good. Now let me check some other area of my controller. 
going to click down here and I'm going to turn some knobs. All right, now I'm turning these knobs and nothing is happening. And here's where you get really frustrated because you're wondering what is going on. I'm changing my controller, but it's not talking to anything. This is the main reason I'm showing you this video because different inputs, at least on my controller, control different devices. And it's not a big deal to have multiple controllers using these different inputs. Again, which I'm going to show you as we go along. Let me continue to build this out. So I see it didn't work with the knobs. I'm going to go over and hit a set of sliders that I have. I'm moving those sliders. And again, nothing is happening. This was very annoying the first time I went through this because the whole reason I wanted this controller was to use those sliders. Now I'm moving the sliders and nothing's happening. This began a long process of me trying to analyze what kind of MIDI messages were being sent. Just so much stuff that's not apparent when you don't understand what's happening here. Now I'm gonna actually hit the keys on my keyboard. Oh, now there it goes again. As I hit the keys, now it starts to progress. So I have a connection between the keys on my keyboard and the controller. I have one more set of buttons here. I'm gonna press those buttons. Now I'm pressing the buttons, and again, nothing is happening. So that's as far as I can go with this surface. I can use this surface to play pads from my device, and I can use it to play keys from my actual keyboard. But all the extra knobs and sliders and other things that are valuable on my particular remote are not gonna work on this particular device. So at that point, I'm gonna go build another device. So I go back up to the top left. I'm gonna hit this home button again. My original device is here. I'm gonna go over and hit this plus sign. And now we get to start all over again, building a second device. So in my case, I'm gonna put Nectar in here again. Now again, if I put Ableton or Akai or any of these other options, this would still work because none of these other fields are actually relevant in terms of this working. Only thing that's relevant in terms of this working is the input port. But I'm gonna fill these out with the correct options for now. I'll put in Nectar again. But as I said, this is where you want to make sure you put unique identifiers because it gives me the option to put my LX test in here again. That's not a good idea. So I'm going to come down and hit the option that says add model because we have to keep everything with a unique name. I'll call this LX2. And again, I'm the script creator, so I'm going to put my name in here, but I'll put some kind of different number next to it. All these fields are basically just information. In the end, they have no relevance in terms of how this thing works. But now the important one again, back to the input port. Hit the field for the input. And now the next thing I want you to observe here and understand, every time you create one of these panels and use one of these inputs, it is no longer available to create another panel with. So the input that I used on the other panel just a second ago is no longer in this list. Again, that's something that can throw you off if you're wondering why they're not here. Every time you create a panel, it gets a unique input and you can't use that input ever again. At least not while that panel is active. And we'll talk about that a little bit in a second. So I'm going to choose this next option. At this point, I really have no idea what this does. I know it is connected to my remote device and it was listed as an input back in the studio menu. So I'm going to click on this again to the output. For simplicity's sake, I'm just going to say no output and I'm going to create the MIDI panel. Right from the beginning, I'm going to hit the same pads that I hit when I started before, which I'm doing right now. And I can see that absolutely nothing is happening. So this panel no longer responds to those pads. If I hit the keys on my keyboard, which a second ago it responded to, it's no longer responding to those either. But now if I turn one of the knobs, now there it goes. And now the knobs have become active and all that capability on my controller is now functional. If I come down here and I hit some of these sliders that I have, now it's starting to progress that way. So I can control my sliders as well. So this input, is able to control the knobs and the sliders and the buttons from my controller. I'm gonna go back to the home again. But this other controller allows me to control the pads and the keys from my keyboard. Between these two controllers, I can access everything that's on my device. I can't get access to everything on one controller only. Now, this is no big deal because the next step in our process, we go up to the upper right and there's a button up here it opens up the Mapping Assistant. When you open up the Mapping Assistant, this is where you can take any particular device, click on a knob or a slider or anything you've created, and then you can go to a track or just a million other options. Let me go to this slider, for example, and click on it. And it's made that connection and it shows you up here. And I hit the button that says Apply Mapping. From that point on, when I turn this knob or slider or whatever it is, it's gonna change this volume control. And that's how it works with these remote devices. Now, how do I get to my second device? This is only one of my devices, and I have two devices I've created. In this list, I click on it, both of those devices are right here. If I change to the other device, I can now begin creating mappings on this device. By simply clicking on something, I'm gonna go to a different track, hit a different slider, whatever I need done, and then apply the mapping. 
all the mappings that you create per device are going to be listed down in this area in the mappings. And you can actually create multiple pages of these mappings. So you almost have an endless amount of variety that you can create. And then you can go back, switch to your other device, and create multiple sets of mappings for that device. With complete control over every option that you have on your remote device and access to using it and connecting it to any part in Cubase. After you've created your panels, if you want to come back and customize them or change something, you can click on any panel. Up on the toolbar, there's a little pencil. If I click on that, I can select any knob or slider. I can drag it to a new location if I want to. I can come over to the left and change buttons to different options if I want. Or I can hold shift and select all my different buttons. I could move those. Or again, I can change them to some other option of a slider or a button. Anything that I need to do to change it. And then finally, probably the most important thing of all, going back up to your studio menu and coming down to your MIDI remote manager. Typically, the scripts that you've just created are going to be in this MIDI controller area. But I'm going to show you instead, go over to the scripts tab. And as you move down this list, you'll see specifically anything you've created designated as being local. They don't have a checkbox by it. This is where you're going to go when you want to back up these scripts. And you definitely want to back these up. All you have to do is highlight the one you want to save. You get a preview of the picture, but at the very bottom, you have an option that says export the script. If I click on that, an area from my computer opens up. I can navigate to a specific folder. For me, I have a particular folder that I save all my scripts, my Cubase profiles, and even favorite templates. I keep them all in one particular folder. So I go to that folder. I also like to put the date by everything I save. So over time, I'm able to locate the latest one. But either way, once I say save, and this new script that I've created is now backed up. Some point in the future when you have to load these scripts, for whatever reason, because they became corrupted or you're on a new computer, you come over to the tab at the very top that says import the script. Something will open up on your computer. Simply navigate to where you save your scripts. Again, that's why it's nice to have a central location or a folder that you've designated for this. If you find that folder and choose your script, simply say open and it will come back into this list. You'll see your remote control open up. And ultimately, if you go up to the mapping assistant, you'll have your remote control surface in there, all your different mappings. If you need to change the surface, you can just select a different one from the list. All those mappings will be there. And now you can make full use of the power of the remote control in Cubase. So have a go with some of those tips. Learn how to create your own surfaces depending on your own particular device. Then go make some great music with it. And I will see you next time. All right, it's going to wrap it up for today. As always, if you haven't already, click the link in the description of this video to learn how you can get access to the all-new Digital Audio Manual Preferred. It's the clear, step-by-step -step solution showing you not only the tips, but all the secret and typically never talked about features that'll take you to a higher level of using your software. If you've been searching for an all-in-one solution to take you from start to finish and learning Cubase, WaveLab, and other music software, this is exactly what you've been looking for. So click on the link in the description and come and be part of the clear path to a better learning experience. So today we had a look at building our own custom MIDI remotes in Cubase. We began by looking at the studio menu, the essential information that's located there. Then we removed the existing panels and began the process of creating them right from scratch. We went through all the steps of building and testing our first surface learn how to fill out the information field step by step, went through various testings of adding knobs and sliders, we repeated the process using different inputs to create a whole new surface, we went back and learned how to customize our existing panels, and then ultimately we learned the most important thing of all, how to back it all up so we don't lose any of our hard work. And we will continue to explore all these different features and functions and all our creative options with the tools that are available to us. As always, it's great to have you guys here, and I will see you on the next video.